I got a tiny piece of ground and I call it my own. Call it my own. Call it my own. I got a tiny piece of ground and I call it my own. It's a home for a big old redwood tree. You know the loggers may not like it, but I call it my own. Call it my own. Well, good evening, and thank you for joining us again for another edition of the Eco Review. We're a live, hour-long journal focused on environmental issues of importance to just everybody I can think of. Tonight, we have one of those really stellar opportunities. We have a great panel of, of guests, and we're trying something totally unique. And I want to uh, let you know ahead of time, I mentioned live, so get out your pen and write down this phone number, 831-425-8844. You'll see that periodically appear on the screen tonight, but um, if you have a question or a thought for our guests, we welcome um, you calling in and joining our conversation. Uh, what a unique day. We all know what, um, what Thanksgiving means here at Eco Review, and yes, we're going to be giving out this dandy little fellow tonight. Our Turkey Award is going out this evening, but that'll be at the end of the program, so you'll have to stay tuned to, uh, to figure out who the real winner is of, of this evening's salutation. But I tell you, as we progress through the night, uh, there'll be no question in your mind where we're intending to, uh, to place this fellow for his home in the holidays here. I want to introduce in the panel, live in the studio with me tonight, and uh, no stranger to our audience, fortunately, mm -hmm. Dan Hayfley. Hey, Tom. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's just a pleasure. Dan is uh, executive director for O'Neill Sea Odyssey, and uh, all of us see the, the beautiful uh, school bus, the school boat that uh, O'Neill has out in the harbor. And First the bus, then the boat. <laughs> <laughs> Not in reverse order. Then they reverse when they go home. <laughs> this is just a great way for school kids all across California, the, uh, the Bay Area of California, uh, to be learning about the oceans, unique opportunities and concerns about the oceans. And we're going to be looking at that seriously this evening. And, um, before I get my next uh, guest on the line and our, our uh, uh, guest by Skype, I'm going to play a little introductory clip because um, I think that um, Arnie and Maggie Gunderson are heroes in our time. And I'm, I'm hoping that recognition uh, carries out across the globe because they're telling uh, stories that need to be told about what's really happening in our environment uh, of serious import in relation to the results of the tsunami in Japan, the results of the meltdown in Fukushima. And I'm going to be bringing on Arnie in just a moment, but I'd like you to see this first clip came out in uh, April this year. It wasn't the very first one that uh, Fairwinds Associates put out, but it's one of the key um, components to information that we just don't get access to. Arnie is a, an expert witness, he's a nuclear engineer, and um, this is not just fictional data or someone's interpretation of what might be going on. These are factual accounts that Arnie has uncovered for us, and we're going to share one. This is the first one uh, I want you to join us for. Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds Associates. It's Sunday, April 10th, and for a change of routine, I wanted to do a science experiment today. When Back in 1978, I was the lead nuclear engineer on a project in upstate New York. And the company I worked for at that time bought the last nuclear reactor that was ever bought during the first nuclear renaissance. Uh, the project was later canceled. But as part of that, one of the things that the vendor gave me, who we bought the reactor from, was a piece of a nuclear fuel rod. This is a nuclear fuel rod. This is zircaloy. And it's, um, it's the element that's inside of the Fukushima reactors. Now these are about 12 feet tall, and there's thousands of them inside the Fukushima reactor. This is a simulated pellet of uranium. Now it's not the real thing, it's plastic. If it were the real thing and had been operating in Fush Fukushima, I'd be dead by now. But these pellets go into these fuel rods, 
and over four years create a lot of heat. When the reactor shuts down, they remain hot. So what I wanted to do today is to show you what happens to zircaloy when it gets hot, as it happened when the, when the water stopped in the Fukushima reactors. Okay, we've got our experiment set up here, and this is what we plan to achieve. Here's that fuel that I took the plastic out, and we're going to heat it with a torch to simulate the heat that's coming out of the inside. Then we're going to spray water on the outside, and you'll see steam coming off, which represents the steam that's coming out of Fukushima right now. Now, in that steam is also hydrogen gas because the water hits the zircaloy and creates not just steam but, but hydrogen gas. This is my friend Jim. He's a, he's a great neighbor and he's going to be the acetylene torch person. Okay, the Zircola is cherry red, and now I'm going to spray it with water as if it were getting some water in the bottom of the reactor. What we just did was we oxidized the zirconium. You can see it's a different color now. The metal that was quite strong becomes very, very brittle. And uh, we were just able to break pieces right off the end of it. Well, inside the nuclear reactor, it ran at that temperature for 7 to 12 hours. The fuel got brittle, and all those nuclear pellets then were allowed to fall out. We just created what went on inside the Fukushima reactor. Those, those rods glowed that hot for 12 hours or more. Now what happens is we've created an oxide. This is zerk oxide now, and it's very, very brittle. I think you could see these sharp edges. So the fuel that was inside is now free to fall out and onto the bed of the nuclear reactor and begin to melt through, as, as is happening right now in Unit 2 at least, and perhaps Unit 3 as well. Well, thank you for watching. Arnie Gunderson, Fairwinds, and we'll do another video in a couple days. Thank you very much. Awesome stuff. That was incredible, Arnie. I mean, this was an incredible tragedy. 13,000 people lost their lives in this March 11 tsunami. And, one of the questions and one of the things I've written about has been a debris field that is now heading across the Pacific Ocean as a result of this tsunami. What do you think the impact of the Fukushima uh, uh, radiation would have on this debris field as it moves across the Pacific? My, uh, my, position, my, my position on the debris field is changing and it's actually getting, uh, getting somewhat worse. Uh, I had thought that uh, most of the debris would uh, have not come from the immediate area of Fukushima. And therefore, um, and when the tsunami hit, it was a good five to, uh, to 20 hours between when the tsunami took all this debris out to sea and when the contamination started to come out uh, in, in large quantities. So my original thought was that the debris field wouldn't be too contaminated. But just this week, um, TEPCO announced that they had picked up very shortly after the accident relatively high levels of cesium, uh, 2,000 kilometers, about 1,400 miles offshore. So um, I think that the debris field is going to be carrying cesium uh, across the ocean. It might be washed off in the meantime, and, and that's, um, uh, you know, that's uh, going to be something we'll have to find uh, uh, in the future. I'm really worried more, though, 
about the uh, uh, about the fish, especially the ones at the top of the food chain, the tuna and the salmon and things like that. Over the next couple of years, this um, this cesium will get picked up and bioaccumulate right up the food chain. You know, it's interesting, Arnie. We we had um, Dr. Jay Nichols on uh, recently, who's a UCSC uh, marine biologist, and and uh, we were talking about that floating field because there was in all of these. All of these articles, the news that we get, um, appears in one place, one time, and then it's gone. And if you happen to miss that news story when it, when it was registered somewhere, you just don't see it again. But I saw this piece uh, about three weeks ago that was talking about 20 million tons of radioactive debris that was floating in a block toward Hawaii and then headed for the western shores. And, you know, I did some rough calculation with it and was talking with Jay about it a little bit. And, and we said 20 million tons is essentially enough debris to put a foot deep layer across Rhode Island, Delaware, and the District of Columbia, where maybe it belongs, but that's not where it's going to hit. It's going to hit Hawaii and it's going to come to the west coast. And uh, when, when did you catch wind of that? Yeah, but by the way, I have to say thank you for having me. I kind of jumped the gun there. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be on your show. Oh, um, we're delighted with your work and you. It's an honor to have you. The, uh, you know, the, what I discovered, uh, well, scientists discovered that the, this cesium that's in the ocean was not spreading out. Uh, you know, the theory had been that the cesium would dilute pretty much uniformly, almost as if you dropped... Uh, you know, some dye into a bottle, over time it would completely be uniform. And that's not happening. It seems to be sticking in the um, ocean currents. And so we're seeing high levels of cesium in the, um, in the ocean currents. And then, you know, laterally to the currents, we're not seeing cesium at all. It's, I think that's a big surprise. We had thought uh, that, the, that the cesium would spread out over the whole Pacific. That doesn't seem to happen. So I think, you know, when the debris field and the, uh, and the cesium that's carried um, in, the, in the ocean uh, hits, it won't be as diluted as scientists had expected it would be. That's, that's fearful. And it really, it's an interesting segue. One of the things that Dan has brought for us this evening, it's not uh, nuclear waste, but Dan, what would you classify this as? Well, this is, as we know, about 14 billion pounds of trash finds its way into the world ocean every year. And in, the, uh, in each ocean, or each portion of the ocean, Pacific, for example, you have the Pacific higher, the Pacific gyra, where we have a plastic soup that results from these uh, the materials and you notice if you I don't know if you can get a close look at this but you have very small particles this is actually a sample from the Pacific gyre these are very small sample uh, portions of plastic that photodegrade not biodegrade they break down into very small parts because of the wind and the salt air and the sun out in the ocean environment now I know that this debris field is um, is going to take one to three years depending on the weight to reach the U.S. So the question is, are we going to see a similar degradation? Some of these materials have been in the gyro for many, many years. What are we going to see as a result of this field? And if there is radioactive contamination in that field, mm -hmm. is that going to also disperse and bioaccumulate as you were indicating? Yeah, I don't know if you've been following that, uh, the uh, gyres that are all over the globe at this at this point, Arnie. But it's kind of like the Dead Seas. You know, we yeah. we, we have uh, 500 of those accumulating uh, around the planet now. Yeah. Isn't that right, Dan? Or that equivalent of the Gulf, but right. replicated um, all, all over the planet right now. And what would be so? As you were talking about earlier, and I want you to maybe explain. How does the cesium get up into the atmosphere? How does it get out? And how far does it travel before it falls in the ocean? What is, what is that path? And what is the impact of that call? Is there something for that process? Well, there's, there's a couple of hundred isotopes um, that, that are released in a, in a nuclear accident. Um, some are um, relatively short half-life, uh, like iodine has an eight-day half-life. So in uh, 80 days, it's got 10 half-lives. Uh, we talk about cesium as if it's the only thing, 
-hmm. But in fact, uh, there's several kinds of cesium, 134, 137, and, and there's also strontium and, and other isotopes as well. But what happens is, um, if you remember back in that clip you started the show with, they are in that gap between that little tiny pellet and the rod that fits over it, uh, gases build up. Mm -hmm. And when that rod shatters or when it becomes brittle, almost immediately all of the radioactive gases are released. Those are things like uh, xenon and, uh, and krypton. They're noble gases and they don't react. 100% of those gases were released and, um, over the first couple days of the accident. And then what you're left with is the cesium and, and other isotopes. Now what, what happens with the cesium is that the um, um, theory was, and, this, and TEPCO is, uh, is still not admitting the severity of the problem with cesium in my mind. The cesium goes into the suppression pool at the bottom of the reactor. But uh, that only holds the cesium and traps the cesium as long as it's below boiling. But we know at Fukushima, the water boiled for days. Mm. So all of that cesium that was in that suppression pool can get re-volatilized. And the containment was cracked, so it went out. It went airborne. The, not just in the explosions, not just in the Unit 1 and Unit 3 explosions, but over a period of weeks, those, um, those containments were leaking and the cesium was not being trapped in the suppression pool, a thing called the decontamination factor, DF. The Japanese are assume, assuming 99% of the cesium was left behind and only 1% got released. But in reality, what's happened is, when, as long as that water was boiling, which was for the first couple days after that accident, um, all of that cesium was volatile. So it goes up and stays probably in the first seven kilometers, five miles of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, the traveled inland, we all know that. And about now, the, the numbers today show that 10% of Japan is contaminated. And it's important to remember that the wind largely was blowing out to sea. This yeah. accident would have been much worse if the wind had been blowing toward uh, the land as opposed to being a, a off sea breeze. So. Um, a lot of it now is in the ocean, and um, an enormous amount is on the, in the mountains. What we're seeing now is the cesium is showing up in places where the plume didn't reach because it's running down the rivers from the mountains and showing up in bays that, in fact, had never seen the airborne uh, cesium to begin with. So it's, it's still spreading. Not, it, it, it hasn't stopped yet. Well, has, has the um, meltdown itself actually stopped? Because I think most people are under the impression, like, you know, with the Gulf, BP said, oh, it's clean up, it's time to clean up now, and, and everybody's like, oh, great, it's business as, as usual. But we all know that isn't the case, and just recently when the storms went through, all the big tar balls were washing up on, out of the sand that they had tried to bury it in, and that hasn't ended at all. So. Um, what, what is the current status with the reactors as you understand it? Yeah, when you turn a nuclear reactor off, you don't turn it off. You know, it, um, the control rods drop in and in two or three seconds, 95% of the power disappears, but then you still have 5%. And, and I've explained that as this is a uranium atom, 95% of the heat is liberated when they split, but 5% remains in these fission products. Now we're less than 1%, and actually we're less than a tenth of a percent. But that's still thousands and thousands of horsepower of heat is, is in this molten blob at the bottom of the reactor. The reactor has failed, we're, we're sure of that. And the molten blob has drizzled out almost like um, a soft ice cream onto the floor of the containment. Now, I think it's spread out pretty uniformly on the floor and there's a large amount of water above it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think the nuclear core has melted down through the concrete, I hope not. There is a, a gentleman in Japan um, who's been saying that he expects uh, violent explosions and things like that uh, as this core hits the water table. I don't think that's happening because it drizzled out like, a, like an ice cream and then spread out like a pancake on the bottom. 
there's plenty of surface area to cool it. But it's still, as you said, it's still creating heat. Those units are still steaming. So what the Japanese are doing is they put a tent around unit one, <laughs> um, not to hide the steam, but to capture the steam and send it up the stack. And over the next six months, they're going to put a tent around uh, unit three and unit four as well. Again, they're going to try to capture it and send it up the stack where it has a better dispersal, gets to spread out, and it isn't so, um, um, it isn't so local. I hope I answered that. Yeah, ab absolutely. And one thing I wanted to ask you um, before we get too far along in this, and, and our audience, I, I think our viewers are the type of people that totally appreciate and understand what, what it's taking for you to get this kind of information out and that you're an expert witness. You're not necessarily advocating for any specific pos position around uh, nuclear energy, but tell us really briefly your credentials are, and, and why is what you have to say about nuclear power relevant and, and substantial? Um, well, I have a bachelor's and master's in nuclear from Rensselaer. I was first in my class and uh, first in the nuclear department, 20th out of the whole school. And I had an Atomic Energy Commission scholarship. Uh, I got my reactor operator's license on the research reactor there. Then I worked my way up from, uh, from a cub engineer all the way up to a senior vice president in the nuclear industry for a licensee. I was on the radiation safety committees. Um, I, I, um, I became a nuclear whistleblower in 1990, and the NRC botched the inspection um, and uh, was taking bribes from my uh, employer. Um, that finally got identified in congressional hearings with John Glenn in 1993. And the chairman of the NRC at the time said, Mr. Gunderson's done quite a service for the United States of America. Um, it, it felt good, but it still, it, you know, I was still uh, labeled in the industry as, uh, as a whistleblower. And then- uh, Yeah, I like that's a bad thing, right? Um, it's bad to tell the truth. I had a very famous attorney tell us, uh, uh, Arnie, in this business, you're either for us or against us, and you just crossed the line. And I, that, that's how it's been since then. And I continue to do expert reports, um, Three Mile Island and uh, St. Lucie and Indian Point and the AP-1000 reactor. Um, and um, uh, I've also been the one who identified the tritium leaks here in, uh, in Vermont. So it's been a, a, you know, a, a 39 year odyssey. You know, I've got to say one of your favorite quotes and I know Dan has a question for you, but I, one of the favorite things I've, I read from you was uh, sandbags and nuclear power plants don't belong in the same sentence. <laughs> Absolutely. And actually, that's probably a very good segue. But Arnie, my question for you is sort of following up on what I was asking about before when it comes to uh, uh, dispersal of, of this contamination, what there may be of it. You indicated some is going into the atmosphere and a piece of this is going into the ocean and parts are going into the debris field and the rest is spreading out over land. How do you see this traveling, say, east across the Pacific in terms of the traces of, of contamination and what do you see happening with it? Um, yeah, I think most of the airborne releases are gone now. Now, there still could be a hydrogen explosion, and, and uh, that would, of course, re-volatilize everything again. But uh, barring that, or um, my biggest fear remains uh, Fukushima Unit 4, which in a severe earthquake could still collapse, and the fuel pool is, um, is very precarious. Uh, so barring uh, an earthquake that knocked over Fukushima 4 or a hydrogen explosion, I think most of the airborne releases are are over in to a large degree. They're still going to be releasing cesium, but not anywhere near as much as in March or April. So we're at a point with the airborne releases where we can't run and we can't hide, and it's pretty much uniformly distributed. It did fall more heavily on the on the Cascades in, in your neck of the woods. Um, it seems like the uh, you know as the as the moist air moved across the Pacific, it hit the Rockies and, and dumped on the Cascades. Um, we have data from uh, Portland and uh, in the Oregon area that shows around uh, 
80 uh, becquerels per, uh, uh, per, per uh, kilogram in the, uh, in the soil. So uh, it's there, but it's not as significant, I believe, as what's happening in, in your ocean. Uh, it, we're, it's, it's slower, though. You know, the, the ocean moves, the ocean current moves a lot slower than the air current. Okay. So I think we've got a slug of cesium and other things that are being picked up by the by the benthic organisms and working their way up the food chain into uh, the, the the top of the food chain animals like tuna and salmon. I, I love salmon and I'm eating as much as I can this year because I'm a little bit concerned, you know, two or three years out that we'll start to see increasing cesium levels in it. Yeah, that's just a, a frightening prospect, and I think it's one of those things. Um, you, the David Bloom and, and uh, Jay Nichols were on last program, our, our viewers would recall, and, and one of the things we were talking about is what is happening to um, our food security here? Because you take out, let's say the, the Gulf provides what, maybe a, a, a tenth or a third of our sea, seafood? It's about here? a third of our seafood. It's a huge, it's one of the most productive areas around the United States and certainly competitive in the rest of the world in terms of uh, different seafoods, absolutely. And then you, you m multiply that impact, in, and in that China Sea, in the, in the Sea of Japan and stuff, you've got some pretty tight competition for food resources there. Yeah, you have a lot, yes. I, I wonder um, what uh, the implications are for those nations and peoples that are dependent on that immediate sea life area. And Arnie, do you have any data that would talk about when it would be before we'd see, wow, don't eat that seafood because people are actually coming down with something because of that, or the seafoods, how long would the sea life live? I wonder if we would even know that. Well, I, um, th there, there was a paper out about a week or two ago that discussed the fact that the uh, cesium concentrations in rivers hundreds of miles away are increasing, not at the top end of the river, but as the river uh, goes down, it seems to be accumulating it more and more and more, and they're seeing it in the soil. So I, I don't think we're, uh, we're at the end of the issue of contaminating Sea of Japan or the Pacific from the uh, runoff from, from land. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, I've seen some small fish that in small fish where the cesium levels were clearly uh, uh, much too high for consumption. But that still hasn't worked its way up the food chain yet to uh, the, the type of fish that, that you and I eat, you know, the, the tunas and the salmons and the mackerel, the, 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 the top predators. You know, the other piece of this is we're focusing on cesium. Cesium is a muscle uh, absorber. It's absorbed in your muscles like potassium. But <clears throat> strontium is a bone absorber. So we're going to be seeing, in addition to the cesium in the fish muscle, which most of us eat, is strontium in the bone. Now, in, in America, not many people eat the bone, but there are some fish that are eaten whole. And there's also fish stews that cook with the bone as well, and that will mm. re-liberate the, uh, uh, the strontium. So in the, uh, in the next several years, I'm, I'm concerned. Frankly, I think uh, you know the, the EPA and uh, uh, it's just stopped monitoring what's coming in from uh, Japan, and I think sooner or later we're going to get a, a tuna being pulled through uh, off a ship and firing off a radiation detector or something like that. I I, I don't really think that uh, on the West Coast the government's doing a very good job of monitoring this. Uh, and on, Arnie, I want to confirm something you just said. I, was, uh, I wrote a column in my Sentinel column back in August about a Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institution study that's funded by the Moore Foundation. And they've had some cooperation from the Japanese government, from TEPCO, the power company. And in their announcement of the study, they basically indicate uh, uh, the same thesis that you have. And I'll read here from this that the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution announcement of the study says that while elevated la levels of radiation in ocean waters could present little direct impact uh, for human exposure, long-lived isotopes can accumulate in the ocean food web, as you indicated, and bioaccumulate, and, quote, emit a persistent low dose, unquote, in the marine environment. A persistent low dose, but over time, 
this could pose a threat within the marine food web as, as um, things bioaccumulate as they move up. So that is entirely possible not to be alarmist about this, but I have not seen any uh, of the data that Woods Hole, they began this study soon after the, um, the accident or the, um, the tsunami, the accident occurred back in March. And I'm very, I'll be very curious to see what these results are. They've been doing transects off the coast of Japan um, for quite a while now. I thought you know, I think you're you're right about the low dose issue for those people on our side of the Pacific, Australia, and, and quite likely Hawaii. Uh, I think, uh, and so that becomes a public health issue, where a little bit of exposure spread out over millions of people has a has a, a carcinogenic effect. But it's hard to say who got that cancer from the from the exactly. cesium from Fukushima. But on the on the other coast, on the uh, within 200 miles of uh, Fukushima, up or down the coast, um, I th I would uh, I'd suggest not to eat anything, um, not because of a low dose, but because of the likelihood of a uh, of a significant dose from from a, a fish. Yeah, I was just talking to a, a good friend today, and and uh, they mentioned that. Um, their daughter had been selected to do a sister city swap in um, in the coming year and that she was going to be going to Tokyo as part of this sister city swap and I said wow are you gonna allow her to do that what when does travel and tourism and stuff like that look really ill-advised to you it I mean with regard to Japan would you if, would you send yeah. your kid I uh, we have uh, questions like that on the website, and, and frankly, you know, there's so many personal issues that play into it that I really don't don't give advice about. You know, should I move? Or I've had people call and say, should I get pregnant? You know, it's like uh, I I really try not to answer that. Totally there's respect that. Okay. So many personal variables involved. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You know, one of uh, the, another issue, of course, is just the issue of information. And one of the things that stunned me back when um, Deepwater Horizon first erupted and that catastrophe was going on is that BP could declare a no-fly zone in the Gulf. And a corporation could declare a no-fly zone. And now with Fukushima, what kind of uh, challenge is it for you to get information from the, the source? Because it seemed like for the first couple of months, there was nothing coming out of there about what was really going on. Well, you, you know, that's, that's a great, that's probably the, that's a great question. Um, you know, and, and I, it, this, the releases from BP, I mean, originally they were talking about a thousand uh, barrels a day and then it went up. That's called the source term. If it was a nuclear plant, it's the source term. And I saw it at Three Mile Island where the nuclear industry and the NRC deliberately downplayed the source term. It happened at, at, with the BP well. You know, there were people who were saying, this is really leaking worse than you're hearing. And so the source term on BP. And when Fukushima came out, I really vowed I was not going to let that happen. And, and I was on CNN the very first week saying, this is as bad as Chernobyl. And, if the, um, and at the same time, uh, Secretary Chu was saying, American Secretary of, of Energy, Chu was saying, no, it's as bad as Three Mile Island. That, uh, the, TEPCO and the Japanese suppressed that information for five weeks. And unfortunately, what that had to do was, you know, women that should have been, pregnant women that should have been evacuated or young children that should have been evacuated didn't if they relied on the, uh, the Japanese government. I think, though, the, the difference between the Three Mile Island and Chernobyl and Fukushima is that we have the Internet now. And uh, mm -hmm. we've, had, we've had close to 7 million uh, visitors on our on, on our website, plus people that download it to YouTube, so that there's other ways for the information to get out, and uh, people are reacting um, and moving because of what they're hearing from you know experts like me, as opposed to relying on Tokyo Electric. Yeah, I've 
I, I'm always puzzled by what it takes for the public to say, hey, we want to know. You know I, I know most of us are so busy and caught up and, and um, we've got our own things going on, but good grief. I mean, these things impact everybody. And if, if we don't collectively express our right to know about them, um, you know, the fault's bad on us if, if we're not asking for the answers. But we're, at, we're asking. I know a lot of people have been asking for answers on this. And uh, where do you even go? You know, I had Dan Hirsch. I had the good fortune of having uh, Dan Hirsch from UCSC on in April. And, and um, he, at the end of the program, I said to him, OK, Dan, so what's the next step? What's the, the positive action to take away from this talk tonight? And uh, Dan said, there is none. Everybody's being paid by NRC. There isn't a politician that will stand up really against NRC. And golly, as we, uh, the residents and the people that are going to be affected by this stuff for generations, um, it seems like we would have the, the auspices and the authority to say, keep us informed. We should at least be informed. You know, when I was uh, on March 11th, the day of the accident, 11 o'clock in the morning, I, I was talking to Maggie and I said, uh, I can't do business today. I got to watch this accident. I said, they are going to have a meltdown. And so, and the reason was that there was an emergency call out on the internet for batteries. And when I heard that they had, were running out of batteries, I knew they were toast. And, and yet here's the, you know, the chairman of the NRC was saying for weeks that, well, we really don't know yet. We, you know, we need to evaluate it more. Um, but the data within the first six, seven, eight hours of the accident told me that there was a, a meltdown in progress and significant fuel damage in three different reactors. So it, People know this, but very few people share this. And I, I think, again, what, and I said it on our website, the difference this time is that we can all talk on the internet and we don't have to rely on those official channels. Yeah, that's a, still for now, the internet's open for us. I, you know, I'm, I'm with a quandary where time, time is ticking by here. There's two clips I'd really like to show, Arnie, and one of them is um, the data gathering process, because I think that's pretty unique. Yep. And uh, the other is your latest clip with, with the uh, hydrogen uh, explosion. And I don't know which you feel is more relevant or more, more exciting to our talk here tonight. But with Dan, well, with, with the Sea Odyssey group, I kind of feel like it's the data collection. But I, it, I want... it definitely is the data collection one. That one is scientifically much more important. Yeah. And the other one's on the website. So want to go up on the Fairwinds website they can get up right now and we have and we do have uh, uh, we do have that URL for viewers to see Fairwinds is that correct with an e yes Fairwinds with an e fairwinds.com okay so people want to get the updated information that you have uh, to get out to them this way of sharing information they can log on to your website and, and get that information from you right okay so anyway, I just, just want to say from my perspective, writing about this, and we were actually at the receiving end of the tsunami. We operated out of the Santa Cruz Harbor, and 10 hours, 500 miles an hour later, we received the tsunami in the Santa Cruz Harbor. And on the West Coast, several other harbors suffered great damage. So, uh, But this is nothing compared to what is happening in Japan. So I want to thank you again for, uh, for bringing us this information. Hi, I'm Ernie Gunderson from Fairwinds. Little change of venue today. There's been some reports in the press about a hydrogen buildup inside the containment at Fukushima. And along with that hydrogen gas, there's a discussion that there's some radioactive isotopes that are in the containment that could only be caused by a fission. Well, I thought I'd simulate today what a hydrogen buildup inside a containment looks like. Now, we're going to use this bottle as a containment. And I'm going to generate hydrogen gas in this little flask. Those, um, those nails are coated with zinc. And I'll add some acid to the zinc. And we'll create hydrogen gas out this hose. Put the hose in the bottom of the bottle. And hydrogen, being lighter than air, is going to push all of the gas out of this bottle. We'll be left with a bottle full of hydrogen. All right, let's see what happens. 
This is something you, you shouldn't try at home. Um, I'm wearing gloves, and we've got a fire extinguisher in the corner, as well as bountiful water, just in case. Um, again, don't try this at home. All right, here's our beaker. And this is muriatic acid. And those bubbles are hydrogen gas bubbles. that are filling this containment, this bottle, with hydrogen. Now we're going to wait a little while here for this bottle to completely full. Again, hydrogen is lighter than air, so it's going to float to the top, and then it's going to gradually, gradually gotta push all of the air out of this container. Now we've waited about four or five minutes, and this bottle should be filled with hydrogen gas. All those bubbles ran out that hose and filled this bottle with hydrogen gas. All right, I'm going to take the hose out and set the, um, the acid aside because the next part of this lab is inside the bottle. All right, now hydrogen gas is lighter than air. So we put it in the bottom, but there's no place for it to go at the top, so it's going to stay in there. It's not going to leak out. Well, now I've put a little hole in the top of this bottle and I'm going to light it with a match. Now what's going to happen is you're going to be seeing a little tiny flame up here. And that's the hydrogen gas escaping. It's barely visible. And I'll try to enhance it in a minute. Now there's a little flame at the top of this. It's made of hydrogen gas, pure hydrogen gas. You can see I just lit this. You notice the bottle is not burning. It's just the very tippy tippy top of this. That's hydrogen mixing with the oxygen in air, forming that flame at the very top of this bottle. Now, The situation is not stable at all. That's a pretty incredible demonstration there. Well, that's, that's a hydrogen deflagration. And, that's the smaller uh, of the two shock waves. That's, that's what happened inside unit one. The shock wave in okay. that soda bottle only traveled at the speed of sound. Fukushima 3 was a different kind of explosion. But the and, and was a detonation. Um, there was much more force in the explosion of Fukushima 3 than of Fukushima 1. But I wanted to show that because there's still a hydrogen buildup in, the, um, in these three containments. And the only reason they're preventing another explosion is because they keep pumping lots of nitrogen in. The uh, visual that you had sent us, uh, Arnie, you know, the arrow with the uh, the rubber on rack and that sort of stuff? Yes. Yeah. Um, now, that's, that's from the Unit 4 fuel pool. And it was taken um, at the worst of the conditions in Unit 4, when they just started to pump water into the pool. And I believe it shows that the very top of the racks were exposed to air. If you look at that whole clip, um, it's a TEPCO clip, you'll see the steam is coming up from what appears to be below the top of the racks. And I think that was a, uh, the cause of the, uh, the explosion in Unit 4. 
was the condition of the pool. We'll find out more about that in the next year or so when they can get in the pool and, and actually take a look. But uh, I made fuel racks for a living, and uh, uh, to me it looks like they were exposed to air, and air does not cool a nuclear fuel rack wow. very well. Yeah, how, how's seawater work for that? Seawater's worse. No, <laughs> what sea water does Especially bad for the seawater. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I wonder, you know, the, the thing that was amazing to me is here you've got, uh, when they started flooding the reactor with the, the seawater, and then the containment kind of device that they came up uh, with were those straw erosion control barriers that you I see on that. Caltrans using on the side of the hill to stop dirt from mm -hmm. sliding exactly. down the hill. What, was that actually something to do, or was that just somebody's idea that we have to make it look like we're doing something? Uh, well, the saltwater issue, um, you know, it was the last, no one, every engineer knows you don't put salt against stainless steel, especially if the stainless steel is at 1,000 degrees or 500 degrees or something like that. It's very dangerous. But they knew they had to because they had no other choice. Mm. Uh, and the, in the chain of command, the, the plant manager at Fukushima uh, wanted to do it. He asked his superiors, and they said, no, don't do it. And he overrode his own superiors. And the plant manager, to my mind, is a hero because he overrode his superiors. He had to get water in, or they would have had to evacuate the whole site. Uh, so uh, if there's anyone who bucked the trend, it's the plant manager at Fukushima for, for basically telling the senior management that he wasn't going to do what they asked him to do. And he, he was down to his last card, and he pumped the salt water in. Uh, a really brave man. Wow. I, you know, I, I want to come back. We didn't see the clip on data collection, but I want Dan to explain a little bit about what you guys do on the Sea okay. Odyssey with okay. the kids. And then I want you, Arnie, to explain um, what you've done with um, the data collection for Fukushima here. Okay. Well, what I want to do is um, direct uh, you to a couple of the pictures that we have up here of our program. And data collection is part of what we do. It's actually for educational purposes. We don't collect data for a marine laboratory. Uh, O'Neill Sea Odyssey is a youth science program. Uh, we serve around 200 schools a year. And uh, we serve mostly low-income youth. It's a free program. And one of the, the, core, the core of our program is plankton, which is, of course, the phytoplankton is the core of the marine food web. So when we, um, when we are out on the boat, we stop at three places, and we have three groups of kids. And um, I have another photo here of, um, of some work we do with navigation. So what we do is at each point, we uh, note where that point in the ocean was, and then we also collect plankton at that point um, with a plankton net. And each of these three groups will come back to our education center, which is at the Santa Cruz Harbor, and we'll look at the plankton, uh, the density of the plankton, the types of plankton. And of course, this way the kids learn in a hands-on way about how things work in the marine food web with this being the base, how bioaccumulation works. In other words, if there are toxins, how they accumulate moving up the marine food web. It's a great science lesson. Um, but I think here, the kids are also learning the scientific methods. So things like collecting data uh, as a result of the Fukushima accident, for example, makes a lot more sense to them. And of course, they're doing it in an outdoor environment. The most important aspect of this is the ocean is the major feature on the planet Earth. It's integrated with our atmosphere. It's integrated with land, of course, in many, many ways. But the ocean is the largest feature. We know uh, relatively little about it. We do have to protect it. So to engender uh, the next generation of stewards, we have to teach kids about the ocean and how it operates. So our program is the core of doing that. We, we, we begin with that, and then the schools that use our program will use curriculum based on our program to integrate the ocean into the science lessons that the kids have. It's the large, world's largest science classroom. It's the world's largest science laboratory. Um, and the ocean is vast. Uh, it's a major economic uh, feature on our planet, too. 
It's how things move back and forth. We get a lot of seafood out of this. We were discussing before, it produces half of the world's oxygen. It comes from phytoplankton in the ocean. Uh, so we do have to take care of it. And when little things like this happen, there is an impact. So the way we start is through teaching the kids about how, this, uh, about how the ocean operates and how we as individuals have an impact on it. Yeah, it's such a fantastic program, and I hope we get you out here to Santa Cruz at some point, Arnie, and uh, you and Maggie can come out and uh, take a look at the lab. We have a caller on the line, and I would like to get a question in from our caller, so bear with us for a moment, Arnie, and let, let's see how we can relay that. Hello, Carla, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Do you have a question or a comment? I actually have two questions. Oh, fire I away. I have one for Dan, which is, I wish I could go. <laughs> Your program sounds absolutely phenomenal. I wonder the age, uh, age bracket of children you take out. But really important for me is, yeah. is there anything like your program anywhere on the East Coast? I have a nephew who I would just love to get out there, or do I have to fly him to California? <laughs> and then I have a question for Arnie, which is, I live in the high desert. Um, I don't live by Santa Cruz. I don't live on the coast. I don't eat fish. I am very concerned about... Fukushima, of course, we all should be. But do you have any any worries about airborne in the United States, in Canada, in other countries, um, contamination? Um, and B, I thought that cesium really wasn't too troublesome, but I guess I'm wrong on that. And I thought it, it, it went away very quickly, dissipated. And I, I'm thinking maybe I'm wrong on that. And um, besides fish is there a much concern i know you said that in japan they're finding higher levels in the rivers where the rivers are running but what about in our country or in other countries um, is much of this a concern from airborne contamination and i'll listen on the internet thank you so much thank for you. thank you so much for the call so we have a little bit of time here left arnie we have two questions Dan? I'll For the know. age bracket is fourth through sixth grade, uh, and depending on what part of the East Coast you're on, there are similar programs to ours. So how would you find those? Well, which best thing that she can do is email me. Just go on O'NeillCodyssey.org, go to the contact section about the program and find my email, and I'll help you uh, locate those. Oh, awesome. Great. Arnie, are you still on? Yeah, I'm still here. Great. Um, and did you I, hear the question? How how do we track the um, the s spread of this? And if you don't eat seafood, uh, how are you liable to be impacted by it? Um, well, I, I don't know where that listener was from, but I think she said the East Coast. And no, I she, don't. I don't. I don't believe there's a problem with East Coast uh, fishing. Uh, we you know we've seen. Particles of radiation in people's gardens. Uh, uh, Marco Kaltofen, the, the, the guy who does uh, all the analysts, analysis for us, actually dug up his garden and found, uh, you know, cesium it, clearly from Fukushima. And he lives in Boston, but it's low level and it's spread out up and down the coast. And I, I guess you know we're all in this together. We can't run and we can't hide. That doesn't hold. <coughs> The, pal the, the Cascades. I think if you're on the West Coast in the Cascades, you need to demand more of your, you know, Oregon and, and Washington State and California, of your local officials or of the federal government to, to look into uh, what's in the fish. Uh, not just the saltwater fish from the salt that's coming over through the ocean, but also what's, what's rained out on the land and is now, you know, in the, in the local river. So you know I, I guess I had two answers. It, it isn't just the fish. One of the first reports we saw back in late April uh, was from UC Davis scientists, and they were talking about uh, picking up particulate radiation particulate levels in the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir, and that's yeah. the drinking water reservoir for San Francisco. So to say that our drinking water is exposed to radiation levels that were unsafe, and then they said, well, you know what? In disasters, we're going to have a little higher level of unsafe. 
So you know. the, the EPA's answer was, let's move the number up so it doesn't look so bad. But I mean, holy crow, is that the best we can do to protect ourselves? Uh, no, it's not. You know, we also saw the, the hot particles in Seattle back in, uh, back in April. And you know, finally, I've been exonerated because I, we took a lot of flack on that. But um, you know, uh, Marco Kaltofen's paper to the American Public Health Association actually talks about his monitoring equipment in Seattle did pick up the hot particles. So um, it was um, a wave of significant radiation hit the West Coast and sort of settled in on the Cascades. Um, we are down to like three minutes. And I just wanted to share this with our, our viewers. We promised we, uh, we would hand out our, our special Thanksgiving Turkey Award. This goes every year to our eco-disaster people. And uh, I think it's fair to say TEPCO has stepped right up to claim this trophy piece. And I'd be happy to hand deliver to any company representative that wants to come over somewhere where the radiation isn't probably so bad. So it's a good opportunity for them to get away. I want to ask if there's any quick uh, parting thought that you have, and thank you so much. You and Maggie and Fairwinds Associates are just awesome. I really respect your work, and thank you so much for being on. Well, thank you. Parting thoughts is, um, well, first, thank, thank you for having me, and thanks for the, all the people that have watched the Fairwinds site. I really, that's been heartening. We don't take any, any salaries out of this, but it's been heartening to get the email, so thank you. Parting thought is uh, we need to be vigilant and uh, I would not trust uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to take that role away from us. Excellent. Dan, how about you? Well, I just want to say that, and I just want to do a quick advertisement. We're, we have the preliminary results of a long-term study of our programs. We're looking at kids in high school who've been through our program in elementary school, finding that they are retaining a sophisticated understanding of how individual behavior impacts the ocean as well as uh, societal behavior impacts the ocean and we've been talking about both those things today so I think again it's important to us that we stay on top of these crises and these issues but also to educate the kids so that we have stewardship in the future so we don't have these kinds of problems. Boy that's so important. I'm Dan Hayfley from uh, O'Neill Sea Odyssey, Arnie and Maggie Gudnerson uh, with um, Fairwinds Associates heroes to me and uh, uh, you know continue your good work we need those voices in the darkness and tell your friends you can watch this Tuesday Thursday night 6 and 10 p.m. you can see it on the internet this is important please pass it on don't let this info die and we'll catch you on our next live show got a tiny piece of ground and I call it my own, call it my own, call it my own. I got a tiny piece of ground and I call it my own. It's a home for the big old redwood tree. You know the loggers may not like it, but I call it my own, call it my own.